Great to be up here today. Um, I always like to start out with a little story about my time in the military. So, so I'm going to give a quick story, hopefully. Um, this is a story about when I was actually getting ready to transition from my first ship to my second ship. I was on the USS Warrior and my detailer had sent me a list of all the jobs that were be opening up and he said, you know, give me your dream sheet. And so I gave him my dream sheet of jobs and uh, all of those jobs consist of being on the West Coast at the time I was in Texas. And they were all non-mainstream jobs, meaning I wasn't trying to go to a cruiser or a destroyer or an aircraft carrier. I was trying to do something that was out of the ordinary. And so after I sent him my list, I gave him a call and he said, hey Lars, good to go. We've got you set up to, got you penciled in to be the safety officer on the USS Sacramento, which was an oiler out of Woodby Island, Washington. So I was like, cool. I'm looking forward to doing that. And uh, he said, your orders will be coming out in a couple weeks. No problem, just wait for those. And I said, okay. Well, in the meantime, our commanding officer decided to take a trip to Millington, Tennessee, where our detailers are at, and you know, fight for the positions we wanted. And um, I kind of had a contentious relationship with my CO at the time. Um, I saw things one way and he saw things another way and it caused us to butt heads a lot. So anyway, he comes back from Millington and a couple weeks later I don't have orders. And so I called the detailer and I said, hey, what's going on? I don't have my orders yet. Is everything okay? He goes, oh yeah, we just had a little hiccup here. A um, couple things getting sorted out. You'll have your orders in about a week. And I said, great. Everything's still on track. Well. A week later, I got my orders. They were not to be the safety officer on board the Sacramento. No, in fact, they sent me to the East Coast, something I hadn't requested, to a dock landing ship as the main propulsion assistant. That's an engineer. Now, I have an oceanography background. My schooling had nothing to do with engineering. So now, I just got orders to a ship that wasn't on my list in a state that I didn't want to go to and a job I really didn't want. <laughs> but I said, okay, you know, praise God, he'll, he'll take care of me. I went, uh, called the ship up and I said, hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be coming to your ship in a few months. And they said, perfect, that's awesome. Um, we just came back from deployment, we're on stand down right now, and we're gonna be going into the shipyards for repairs. And uh, about the time you get here is about the time we'll be getting out of the shipyard. And I'm thinking, Great, because this is the worst time to go to a ship, because once it goes into the yard, all their certifications, all of their qualifications get reset. And then you have to, then once you get out of the shipyards, work your way through all of these certifications and inspections to prepare yourself for deployment. So I was actually gonna be arriving on the ship at the very worst time in their cycle. So I was like, awesome. This just gets better and better. And uh, so, Shortly after that, you know, I'd send a couple questions to the ship to ask about the job, what are some of the primary duties, and I heard nothing. It turns out the guy they had set up to be my mentor and answer my questions before I arrived left the ship early to go to a new ship. And so all of my emails and everything fell on deaf ears. And so they sent me to, after I left my first ship, they sent me to engineering school. Uh, it was only two months long, so anybody who goes to engineering school for years and years, really, you don't have to. The Navy's got it down. Two, two months is all you need to know everything you have to know about engineering. And about the week before I was supposed to graduate from the engineering school, I decided to go down to the ship to try to find it, because I'd heard nothing from them, dead silence. And they said, well, we're going to be in the shipyard. And I figured, well, how hard is it to get to a shipyard in Virginia Beach, Virginia? <laughs> if you know that area, there's probably about six of them. I think there were six of them at the time I was there. And so not knowing which shipyard, I'm here driving around shipyard saying, is, is the Oak Hill here? Is the Oak Hill here? Is the Oak Hill here? And most of them looked at me like I was stupid. So I had no clue what the ship was. And finally, after the fourth one, I did find the shipyard and uh, walked aboard the ship and the administration officer, she was on the quarter deck and uh, I introduced myself to her. I said, hi, I'm Lieutenant J.G. Lone. I'm gonna be, be reporting next week as the main propulsion assistant. And she just looked at me dumbfounded. Like, Lieutenant J.G. Lone, weren't your orders canceled? And I said, 
boy, I wish so, but no. <laughs> and then she said, well, you look awful young to be a limited duty officer. And I said, well, that's because I'm not a limited duty officer. I'm a surface warfare officer. Now this job, this MPA job, is typically a job reserved for limited duty officers. Those are people who served as engineers enlisted for most of their career. And then they transition to become a, an LDO as an officer role and help support these ships. So I'm really way behind the ball. I'm <laughs> two months of engineering school and they're putting me in a, in a job that normally they put someone with 15 or 16 years of experience into. So. So I'm like, great, this job is just getting better and better by the minute. And then a week later comes by and I report to the ship and they take me up to my stateroom and I go meet the chief engineer, my boss. And rather than saying, hey Lars, welcome aboard. We're glad to have you. We've got quite a task set before us. The first words out of his mouth were words I'll never forget. He said, Lars, misery loves company and I'm miserable, so you will be too. So now, put all this together, I mean, I'm in a place I don't want to be, I'm on a ship I don't want to be part of, I'm in a job that I have no experience for or qualifications for, and now I have a boss whose sole goal is to make me as miserable as he is. And that brings us to our sermon topic this morning, <laughs> count it all joy. So. <laughs> Praise God, right? Yes, this was not a situation. So um, if you remember from two weeks ago, we started talking from the book of John, chapter 15, about the vine and the branch and the fruits. And we kind of ended it off with what the types of fruits are. And we're going to actually pick it up now talking about some of these fruits. The first that we're going to talk about here is joy. So if you want to open your book and kind of remind you where we're at, we'll open it to Galatians 5.22 and get a reminder of what we talked about. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So today we're starting with joy. And if you look at this list... We skipped one. The very first one is, is love. And you might be saying, well, Lars, why'd you skip love? Shouldn't you just start from the beginning of the list? And I mean, really, love is arguably the most important fruit of the Spirit out there. Even, even Jesus himself mentioned, you know, when asked what the most important commandment was, it was to love God your Father with all your heart, mind, and soul. And your second is as important, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So... Why aren't we doing love first? Well, if you also remember, we were in First Peter, or Second Peter, sorry, verses five through eight, and that gave a, 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 an additional list of what the fruits of the spirit are, and they gave the progression of the fruits of the spirit. And if you remember, love was the last one they got to, and so. I think it's important to recognize that, yes, I agree, love is the most important, and we will likely talk about it if I get more opportunities to preach, but it's also the last in the list of fruits because I think it's the hardest one to obtain and to actually live out in our lives. So my idea here is to start with the one that should be the easiest for us to live out in our lives. And so we'll be starting there with joy. And if you look for joy through the Bible, you'll see that it's mentioned, you know, about 150 times or more, depending on the version of the Bible you have. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty important topic. And uh, it's also one that's easiest to recognize in others. If you don't realize this, joy is a manifestation. We kind of manifest it as happiness. So it's something we project outward. And I think that is an important thing that we need to look at and, and uh, why we're actually spending time this morning on the fruit of the Spirit being joy. So... Um, like I said, it is one of the easiest to mature. And if you remember from John 15, he said, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy remain in you, and that your joy may be full. You know, he didn't say that my love will be in you and that your love will be full. It's your, the joy that he's talking about. We're spending time learning the word so that our joy will be full and so that others will see that joy in us. And how do we do that? We get it through spending time in prayer, studying the Word of God. So if you have your Bible with you, now you can open up to Psalms and we'll kind of see 
a little bit more of that. Psalms 1. And it says in Psalms 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in the law he meditates a day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. This is a key to our joy in our life, and that's spending time in the Word of God, delighting in His law. And when we recognize and delight in His law, it allows us to spread that joy to others. And in my... My, my uh, story about my work this morning, if you remember the, the uh, chief engineer, he said, misery loves company and I'm miserable, so you will be too. That's the first thing that the enemy tries to take from us is our joy. Because if we're not joyful and we're not going to be spending time praising the Lord, it means we're not going to be spending time in the Word. And so everything kind of stems from the joy being there in our lives. If we're joyful, we'll be reading the Word. If we're joyful, we're going to be talking to others. If we're joyful, we're going to be spreading the Word of God. And um, we've been doing a study on Thursday nights, and we've seen how Satan has crept into our nation, and he's been taking things over. I think it's because we as Christians are not spreading our joy, the joy of the Lord. So, this is a very important, very important for us to spend time understanding and learning what, what is joy. And more so than just being a great thing, it's also a commandment from God. He's told us, you shall be joyful. So, if you jump into Deuteronomy and I say, study this some more, because this is actually a great time. This is when the, the Jews were fled from captivity of Egypt and are wandering in the wilderness. And... The Lord said to them, And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you, and to your house, you and the Levite, and the sojourner who is among you. So the Lord is telling us, you, you be joyful. It, it, it's something he wants, us, he wants us to be joyful. He's given us joy for this reason. This fruit is there to abound for this reason. And it's really interesting if you continue to read through Deuteronomy, just one chapter over, you know, in, in their struggles of being in the wilderness without their clothes deteriorating and food provided for them every day and, and water and, you know, a pillar of, uh, of fire to follow during the night and a column of smoke during the day that, you know, the Lord was in their presence this whole time, yet they found something to crab about. And God goes on to say, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart, for the abundance of everything, therefore, you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you. I mean, how quickly do we forget our joy? How quickly do we let it slide from us when we have a very simple thing, like not going to the coast we we're hoping to go to, or being stuck in a job we don't want? You know, we can quickly lose our joy if we're not spending time in this Word and following that commandment. And what happens if we lose that joy? Um, he'll set His enemies against us, and we shall fall. So we're kind of seeing that in our nation today. We have not spread the joy of the Lord in our nation, and our, the enemy is coming against us. So where does it come from? This is a great thing. If you hop into Romans, you'll see that it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This gives a good progression right here. You understand that we're given love and we're given hope. From, from joy, sorry, I said love, didn't I? I'm sorry. From joy, we're given hope. And that hope is on what is going to happen, the resurrection, the, the coming again of Jesus Christ. So, understand that our joy leads, it's a progression. We get joy, and it gives us hope, and it gives us further fruits. It also then says in uh, Romans fifteen thirty two, just a few verses later, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. This is telling us that God has given us this joy. He is filling our lives daily with that joy. It's something that we're supposed to be expressing every single day. It's, 
it's it's something that we should be more you know people should see us as we're walking down the street and say you know what that guy's a christian that guy's that guy has christ in his life because of the joy that we have in our lives it, it should be like that every single day psalms goes on to say the lord is my strength and my shield my heart trusted in him and i am helped therefore my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song will I praise Him. Isn't it great that, you know, we had the kids in here singing joy, 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 and you can see them hopping around, and you see that joy coming them, that, that childlike joy, and that's something we should be presenting in ourselves all the time. We shouldn't be afraid to just jump for joy and, and, and praise God because He's given us so much, you know. It's, it's awesome. And it goes on to say that uh, for his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. This is something that is renewed every single day in our lives. Joy. He brings it to us every single day. We should be waking up and not saying, oh, I got to go to work today. Oh, man. Because you know what? Honestly, yeah, work may not be the best thing, but you have a job. You're able to pay your bills. Praise God that I have something to do, you know. Praise God that I'm going to have a way to, you know, take care of my family. Um, praise God I have a way to help those in need in other countries. You know, I can support missions. We should be praising God every single day and not, oh, man, I've got to go deal with that person again today in the office. Ugh, it's going to be terrible. No, we should be saying, you know, we got an opportunity to witness We've got an opportunity to show the love of God to those around us that may not know God and who desperately need to know God. You know, it, it, is, it was always a wonderful thing when I was in college um, to be around non-Christians. I went to a very secular school. I studied, of course, like I said, oceanography. Uh, and uh, everyone around us believed in evolution. <laughs> It's evolution, evolution. There's no such thing as God. There's no belief in God. But it was very interesting because I always held fast to that word of God and said there is a God. And though they would all claim there is no God whenever they entered a trial or a tribulation or something rough in their life at school, however you know, meaningless it was, because it's college, really, they would always come to me and say, Lars, how do I solve this problem? Because they knew that there was something there. They recognized Jesus Christ in my life through the joy that I was spreading in those classes, in the classroom and, and on campus. So this joy is important. It's something we definitely need to be projecting every single day. And you know, you, you'll be surprised at the opportunities that will come into your life just through giving that joy. The, the things that will happen, people will come up to you that have no clue who you are but they'll recognize that you have something special and they'll ask you about it. What's going on with you? Or they'll say, can you help me out? And you get an opportunity to witness to somebody. So be spreading that joy to everyone you see. Now I do want to mention though that there is a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is a physical feeling that we get on this earth. Joy, as we know, does not come from this earth. It comes from God. So if you look in 2 Corinthians 8.2, it says, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. This is a great reminder that you, to be joyful, you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be powerful. You don't have to have great things. No, in, in fact, these were, these were people in deep poverty, yet they recognized that their joy was separate. It was coming from the Lord. They understood that regardless of our situation, the Lord is going to take care of us. He's going to provide for all of our needs. And that is a wonderful thing to recognize. I think it's something we've often forgotten today in this realm. We think, oh, how am I going to pay for my car? Or how am I going to pay for my food? Well, God has promised to give us everything we need. He says, you know, if, if I take care of the birds in the field, how much more will I take care of you? Because you're, you're children of God. We're made in His image. Is He not? I mean, He's going to take care of us more so because we're made in His image. 
So even in their, in their poverty, they were, they were joyful because they knew where everything comes from, and that's from our Lord and Savior. James goes on to say, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You see, so here's a progression that we're, we're talking about. You've got joy. Joy is awesome. You're now in temptations. Oh, kind of like my going to a ship that I didn't want to be a part of in a job that I had no clue how to do. Praise God, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in a situation where I have to lean on the Lord. You know, think about that. When you're in temptation, you're not relying on yourself. You're relying on the Lord. And that's something very important to recognize. So we've got that joy. We're being tempted. Now we've got patience. Something we all think need to work on as well. But you see that patience came from joy and the adversity. So you've got joy in your life, you've got the adversity in your life, you're praising God for that adversity, and now you've got patience. And wait, from that patience, you're, what happens to you? You're made perfect, wanting nothing. You see the progression here? But it all starts with joy. So joy is something we have to focus on in our lives. We have to recognize that part of our life and, and uh, work to improve the joy that we're showing to others. Hebrews goes on to say... Let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now this, to some, might sound like a um, misperception or a misspeak, because he says he's got joy for enduring the cross. How can somebody knowingly get strung up on a cross, bearing the ultimate shame that he did, and still have joy if it weren't for God in, in heaven? You know, if you remember, he, he prayed to God in the garden before, before he was put on the cross and said, Lord, you know, if it's, it's your will, take this from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And so, he knowingly took on something that was awful, just like I knowingly took on that job that was awful, <laughs> but I could joy, take joy in the Lord because He's my strength. He gives us everything we need. He gives us that power. So, and with that, there is sacrifice. Understand that Christ sacrificed everything for us. He died on the cross for our sins. Not that He'd committed any sin. He was perfect. He lived a perfect life. Yet He went to that cross and died there for us, for our sins. And did it joyfully. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? I mean, how can we not abound in joy when we have a Lord who's done the same for us, who's done more for us? We should be shouting from the rooftops, Jesus is Lord. We should be every day out there just beaming with the joy that He's given us for the sacrifice that He's given in our place. But it goes on to say this, um, happiness, which we know is a reaction to the physical, joy is not. Joy is a decision we have to make every day based on the knowledge of God. Romans 15 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, we make the decision every day, Lord, I am going to be joyful because of what you've done for me. And from that we get hope, knowing that He's going to fulfill that joy in our lives every day. He's going to give us that joy because it is His will that we have His joy. 2 Corinthians 6, 1-10. through 10. If you open your words there, this would be a great verse to read. So if you want to, please open to... 2 Corinthians, and we'll read that together. Alright, 2 Corinthians, it says this, We then, as workers together with Him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold now, this is the acceptable time. Behold now is the day of salvation. 
We give no offense in anything that our ministry may, be, may not be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, in much patience, in tribulation, in needs, in distress, in stripes, in imprisonment, in tumults, in labor, in sleeplessness, in fasting, by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. See, there's there's a direction here that the Lord is showing us that, hey, we're, we're going to go through trials. We're going to go through tribulations. And you know what? We, we are in the end times. If you don't see what's happening in this world today with everything happening in Israel, what's happening here in America with Satan coming back in and overtaking our institutions like our schools and the church trying to appease this, this evil spirit and allowing things in the churches that aren't appropriate telling people it's okay to be gay and you can still be saved. You know, this, this is persecution that's happening here and that's warned about in Revelation. This, this world is going to come to an end and, and praise God we get the opportunity to, you know, I believe in our lifetime we're going to get to see the coming of Jesus Christ. Oh. You know, I, I, look at, I, I look at the disciples and say, wow, what opportunity they had to walk with Christ and to be there with Jesus and learn from Him. But you know, they, they experienced probably the greatest hardship of their life, seeing Jesus Christ killed on the cross. And, and you know, the... The fact that they had to witness that and the, the, just the, the sadness that they felt probably from that and just the distraught dismay, what do we do now that Jesus is gone? I mean, he was, he's the rock. He, he's, he's our salvation. He, he, they, they must have been in a, a pretty rough spot there for a while, you know, till the Holy Spirit came and, and really witnessed to them. But what a great time it is for us that we're actually going to get to see the coming back of Jesus Christ. How awesome. So, you know, we can look at the times and say, boy, this is despairing. Um, our money's becoming worthless. You know, the churches are bowing to this, this idea that's coming in. You know, our schools are no longer teaching our kids. We could be dismayed. Or we can look at this from, praise God, we're going to, we're going to get to see the greatest miracle of all time come the return of Jesus Christ and that is that's awesome i mean i take a great comfort in that and you know that should be letting our joy abound and and also giving us a fervor to say you know what jesus is coming guys he's coming soon it's time to repent it's time to return to god because without christ where there's only one other direction you can go and that's hell and uh, that's not a great place to go. Not a great place at all. And, uh, you know, I, I did bring a quote up here from C.S. Lewis. He's one of my favorite authors. He said, uh, Don't let your happiness depend on something you may lose. And understand our lives here are temporary. We will lose these. You know, the money you have in your bank account is temporary. You will lose it. Your house, you will lose it. But you know what we can't lose? Christ. Amen. That's where our joy should come from, is Christ. And we should be more than excited, more than ecstatic to tell others about the great gift that we have and that we will never lose. You know, it's fun too. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, we were having service here, or we were praying here, and, and I'm going to pick on one of my brothers here in the sanctuary, Chet. And uh, he got to talking, and... and Praise God, Chet is here with us. He is an awesome brother. But And if you don't get an opportunity to talk to him, you should, because he gets super animated when we start talking about the Lord and the things happening. And, it, you know, it was great, because you just see everybody talking, and everything's monotone, and we're just not getting super excited. And then Chet starts talking, and everybody just starts piping up. And, you know, the, the whole dynamic in the room changed simply because he started talking and expressing that joy of the Lord. And it's, it's really awesome to see. So I appreciate it, Chet. Thank you for, for that. And, 
You know, so he's manifesting. You can see that manifestation of the joy of Jesus in his life. And it actually excites the people around you. Um, and we can look at Paul and Silas in prison in Acts 16. There's a great example of that, Acts 16.25. And if you read through this section of Acts, you'll know this is when Paul and Silas were walking and preaching. And uh, a girl with an evil spirit in her came up behind them and started basically prophesying that, hey, this is, this is a son of God right here. He's, he's, he's a holy man. He's bringing the word of Jesus. And she just kept saying it, kept saying it, kept saying it. And finally, Paul turned around and said, evil spirit, come out of this child. And she, of course, gave up that evil spirit. And she had masters who were really, really upset at that because she had made them a lot of money. And now their cash cow disappeared. She went back to being just a little girl. And uh, so they got very upset. And since they were well known in that town, they said, these people are disruptors and they threw them in prison. Did Paul and Silas do anything wrong? No. No, they just cast a demon out of a girl. Praise God, you know. It's one of the commandments, you know, the, they were given, you know, cast out demons in my name. And so they were just doing the will of God and they got thrown in prison for it. And what happened in, in prison? It says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, if you read further in that, shortly after that, an earthquake came. And that earthquake busted open all the doors on the prison, and it actually loosed all the chains of all the prisoners. Not just Paul and Silas. Everybody in that prison was, at that moment, basically free. They could walk out of prison if they wanted to. And the jailer awoke and he went down there and thought, oh my goodness, everybody's left. And he was getting ready to commit suicide. And you know what? Paul said, don't do that. Don't commit suicide. We're all here. We're all still here. You know, the amazing thing is here's two men who have, you know, among this town, no, you know, no knowledge of the town, no experience in the town, nobody knows them. And yet, Paul and Silas said, yeah, we're loosed, we're free, but stay here because it's the will of God. And these people stayed for the joy, the praise, and the worship. Isn't that awesome? That they were there saying, yeah, we're going to stay and listen to this praise and worship because we know this is right. And ultimately, that jailer even when God saved. And of course, Paul and Silas went free and they continued the ministry of God because no wrong was found in them. So it's amazing here that the joy, the joy that was given, controlled a whole jail full of people, of murderers, of robbers. They all followed the will of God just because of the joy of two men praising and worshiping God. So you see the effect it has on people when, we, when we're in town, when we're at our work, we should be praising God because guess what? It's going to start a movement on those around us. So, and it brings spectacular power. You know, who here can say they've ever seen a, a jail doors, all the doors open and all the chains fall off the people? <laughs> was that by man's doing? No, that was by God's doing. You know, he planned all of that, and he did all of it through his power and his majesty. And guess what? It can still happen in your lives today, wherever you're at. It can happen in your job. It can happen at home. It can happen here in this church. We can bring people to God just by showing our joy for the Lord. This joy also provides recognition of Christ. It's how we display Jesus to those around us. They recognize joy. If we look at First Chronicles twelve forty, it says, "Moreover, those who were near, sorry, moreover, those who were near to them, from as far away as Issachar, and Zebulon, and Naphtali, were bringing food on donkeys and camels, on mules and oxen, provisions of flowers, cakes of figs, cakes of raisins, wine and oil, and oxen and sheep abundantly, for there was joy in Israel." You see. When there's joy in the land, people come to that location where that joy is. They recognize there's something special there. And that special thing is Jesus Christ in our lives. 
So when we're joyful, when we show that joy, it's going to bring others to us. Because they, everybody's seeking joy. Nobody wants to be miserable. I mean, my, my boss was miserable and wanted to share in that misery, but that wasn't what his desire was in his heart. He didn't want to sit there and say, Boy, I sure enjoy being miserable and wish I could be miserable all my life. No, he wanted joy. He wanted joy in his life. He just needed somebody to bring him some joy in his life. He needed somebody to show it in his life. And as, as rough as that job was, you know, my, my joy was not diminished on my ship, and, and, and his joy abounded on that ship. He recognized something different, and his whole attitude to work changed. You know, and that wasn't my doing, that was, that was the Lord's doing. So, you know, it's, it's important for us to maintain that joy, and it will, it will bring others to us. And Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. You know, prayer is something that nobody can stop you from doing. The only person that can stop you from praying is you. And you know what? You don't have to be fancy about it. You don't have to be in a special place for it. God hears us where we are. You can be driving in your car down the road and be praying to the Lord. You can be sitting in your job in a meeting that really you don't want to be a part of and pray to the Lord. And you know what? He will give you strength in that time. If we read on, and, and, and the, there's a big reason for this joy, and we can read here in Luke 10, 12, 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. You know what? We, we have a joy because we know we are saved. And in that last day that's coming very, very soon, we have a seat in heaven with our Father. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Isn't that cool? So, you know, it's kind of like you basically say you're an alien in this world. This is not your land, you know. <laughs> this is not our home. In Leviticus, you know, the Lord reminds the people that the land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. That's God talking to the people of Israel. The land is His, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. You know, the Lord is telling them here, we have a place outside of this world for you already established. This is just temporary. This is just your opportunity to spread my word to those around you and my joy to those around you. There's a place in heaven for you. That's, that's our home. That's our real home. This is all temporary. And Romans says, Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of your mind, that my testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, this was a very important verse that should be studied. You know, when I went to that ship... It was, of course, not my, by my design. And it was certainly not something the Lord wanted me to conform to. It was a terrible place. <laughs> but it transformed me. And it transformed my mind to a, a focus that is on Jesus Christ. And a recognition that the joy is coming from Him. And that through Him, my strength was received. And you know, I... I went on that tour and did a great job. Um, not having the experience or anything else, not having the knowledge, it, it was a very successful tour in that the ship met all of its commitments uh, on time. There was no setbacks. Um, and I, un well, I, well, I'll say fortunately I left before deployment, or unfortunately, either way, um, I left that ship just before they deployed. But they were the most prepared ship in our fleet to go on deployment because of everything that happened. And all you can say is that's, that's the Lord doing that. That's, that's the, the hand of God working on that ship at that time. And it, it, w it was, you know, in, in that hindsight, looking back at that job, I say, boy, I can really see how God worked and how He moved. And it's an awesome thing to see. And that's why we need to have that joy, because we may not be feeling great. We 
might feel like we're under a lot of pressure while we're there. But the joy that the Lord gives you every day will make what your steps, well, He will make your steps successful. Okay? Never forget that. Never forget that. So here's some good questions. Have, have you lost your joy, guys? Have you, like, uh, boy, this, just life's not going right for me. I don't feel happy. Well, I'd say read this verse often. And, uh, you know, pray this verse. Psalm 51.12 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and hold, uphold me with a willing spirit. You know what? The Lord is the one who gives us our joy. Pray if, if you're not feeling like you have joy in your life right now. Just pray this, pray this verse over and over and over. You know what? He will return His joy to you. He will remind you of the salvation you have in heaven and the home you have in heaven. And He will give you a spirit that's willing to do whatever is required of you. You know, His, his joy or our joy, sorry, is tied to His glory. And that's the reason He wants to give it to us. You know, God has seen through our joy that people see and recognize something in us that is outside of us. So He wants to give us joy so that we can spread that to others. So His glory is shown in our joy. So He wants to give it to you. So when you pray this, you're going to receive it because it's His desire to show His glory. Because he's God and he deserves the glory. So pray this if you're if your your joy is lacking right now. And then uh, Isaiah twenty nine nineteen it says the humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. You see, he's a God that cares. He's also God that recognizes when. We are feeling down that He will provide it to us. And when He gives us that, what else is there to do but rejoice? You know, take joy in the Lord. Praise God we're saved. Praise God we're going to heaven. I may not have everything I want here on earth, but you know what? What I don't have here is stored up in heaven. It's, and, you know, the Word is very clear that it says, don't store up here on earth where moth, moth and rust destroy, but store in heaven where it's permanent. You know, so, so don't, don't be sad. Don't be upset that everything isn't as you want it here on earth. Our joy, our, our, our goal is to be in heaven, and that's where we'll get everything we need. Jeremiah goes on to say he was in a time of tribulation as well. He says, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I'm called by your name, O Lord of hosts. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? I mean, that phrase right there, that I am called by your name. We're called by the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord of hosts. Isn't that awesome that he, we're recognized that way in the eyes of God the Father? That is so awesome to me that uh, he, he cares that much about us that uh, we're called by his name. Praise God. So, as he kind of said here, eat those words. Spend time in the word. Read it. Know it. Learn it. Take a verse each day and memorize it. You know, it's, it's, it's what will actually remind us every day of where our joy stands is in this word. And you know, wake up, just as it said, since joy is renewed every morning, wake up from bed and, and say a quick prayer to God. Thank you so much for keeping me safe through the night, for protecting my family when I was not on watch. Thank you for providing the food that I'm going to eat this morning. You know, we, we, we forget quickly that God has given us everything we need every morning. It's, it's there for us. We've gone to bed. We've not worried about anything. And boom, we wake up in the morning and guess what? Everything's there for us. I mean, you can say, thank the Lord I didn't die in my sleep or something like that. You know, there's so many things that he provides for us every morning. 
then take that opportunity just to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that everything is as it was when I went to bed last night. You know, he's, he's there for us. He's comforting us. So with that, I do have a take-home task for all of you today. I um, need you to uh, go home and, and think about this. What is limiting your joy in your life right now? Because I know we all have things in our life that we let weigh on us. Think about those things that are, are, are weighing down your joy and give them to the Lord. Give them to God. When you go home and say, boy, this is, this is really something that is, is beating me down right now. Give it over to the Lord. Pray to Him and say, Lord, this is, this is on my life. I need, it. I need it taken away. I need relief from it. And you know what? He's going to provide you that relief. He wants to put that joy in your life. You know, second, what have you put ahead of reading your Bible? Think about that. Did you go home and sit down and say, Boy, there's a football game on today. I really want to watch that football game, but I haven't read the Bible today. Maybe before you turn that football game on, you should take a few minutes to read, that, read the Word of God. Study and meditate on the Word of God before you watch that football game. Or, you know, it could be something else. Oh, I'm going to can some food today. I don't know anybody in here who can't. <laughs> Mom. <laughs> but you know, before, before you start that, maybe, maybe take 10 minutes to read the Word of God and study and meditate on His Word. And, and guess what? It's going to bring joy, but it's going to bring strength too. It's going to give you a renewing that you need to, to continue to do the tasks that you need to do every day. So what do you need to do to return to joy? That's a question you can ask yourself. I can give you one answer that's pretty easy. It starts with prayer and it starts with reading the Word of God. Take the time to do that. All right? And then lastly, I'll ask you, how is your prayer life? Um, if, is, is it something that can improve? I know I can say my prayer life can improve. You know, if, if, you, if you know it's lacking, take some time, you know, set aside some time to do just that. If you have a daily planner or anything like that, put down on your planner to pray. You know, once you start forcing yourself to do it, you'll get in a habit of it, and it will start to come naturally to you. So take the time to do that and to uh, spread that word. You know, joy is so important in our lives. It leads to so many other things in our life. We have to do this in order to spread the word of God. And in this time, it's the time, the best time in which to do that. All right. Yeah, praise God. Well, that is all I have today. It's a little bit short, but... Uh, you know, it's good because it gives us time to meditate on the things that we need to do. So if you all would, please bow your head and close your eyes with me today.